We're going to talk this morning about prayer problems and promises. Uh, respecting, but also trusting in prayer. Uh, we protect things we value. Uh, most all of us lock our car door. We lock our homes. Uh, many homes now have these security systems where there's an eye that's a camera seeing who's coming in the front door. And uh, even cars will have uh, multiple cameras <laughs> kind of seeing who might be around the car because we treasure and protect these things. We have insurance policies on things that we know are valuable in case something happens to them. We put covers on things to protect them. We polish things. We put coatings on them. We, dust, we put special things in cabinets simply because we want to protect them. And this morning we'll talk about things we need to do to protect prayer. But we'll also talk about how God helps us with prayer because he knows it's a challenge for us. We appreciate special assistance. Uh, it's tax time. Most everyone will receive some form of assistance, whether it be through H&R Block or online program, or they'll, they'll appreciate getting help from someone to make sure they get it right, because they're not quite sure if they're putting things in properly. And sometimes with our prayers, we're not quite sure if we're praying what we ought to be praying for, or sometimes we don't even know. But God does something amazing for us that we'll look at at the end of today's lesson that's a great source of comfort and assurance for prayer. So we'll talk today about prayer problems, but also prayer promises. First of all, prayer problems. Satan wants to be involved in your prayer life, believe it or not. Satan is not content with just getting you to sin and do something blatantly wrong. He wants to get involved in things that are good, that are spiritual, Things that bring you closer to God. He wants to interfere with the Lord's Supper to distract us and take us to different places other than the cross. Uh, he would love to mess with things that are good. And he does that even with prayer. He wants to ruin it. And there are three ways in which Satan can ruin prayer. Now, he can't do it without our cooperation. Uh, Satan cannot overpower us. He cannot make us do something we don't want to do. But he can certainly worm his way in. And Scripture is clear about three things that can ruin our prayers simply because we allow them to happen or we're not being careful. Uh, Jesus warned even in Matthew 6 about those that would pray just to put on a show for others or they just babble on to impress others. That, that's an example of Satan involving himself in prayer and Jesus correcting it in the Sermon on the Mount. But these three errors we'll talk about this morning that are prayer problems are these. First of all, unrepentant sin, then selfish motives, then doubt. First of all, unrepentant sin. Turn to the book of James chapter 4. I want to talk about how sin can become a problem with prayer. I want to see in James chapter 4 a series of warnings concerning the mindset a Christian ought to have as they're called to draw near to God. Verse 7, James 4. James writes, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will what? Come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. What James does here is gives a series of admonitions and challenges to basically live a sincere, godly life where you are, one, resisting the devil so that he might flee from us. He goes somewhere else when we resist him adequately. Uh, come near to God. He'll come near to you. Wash your hands. And he talks to Christians here, you sinners. Purify your hearts. We sing in the song that Nathaniel often leads, Create in me a clean heart, which is from Psalm 51, where David wants a sense of purity in his life, and which should be our desire as well. Look at chapter 5 now of James, verse 16. Now, we looked at this text briefly last week. 
the very uh, end of the verse, uh, I want us to focus on what we'll start at the beginning. James 5, 16, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Let's talk about what these two passages are saying and, and highlight what's said here in verse 16 where it says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The word righteous in Scripture is not perfect. God is not demanding that we be completely sin-free before we pray. Let me just say that again. God is not demanding that we be sin-free before we pray. We all commit sins of weakness. Even at times there's habitual sins that, where just as Jesus knows every one of our weaknesses, Satan does as well and he continues to press the same button all the time. Because he knows that's what our weakness is and he doesn't press other buttons because he knows we have no interest in that. He will always attack these areas and that is simply our challenge as believers. And as we sang today, the battle belongs to the Lord and we're constantly in struggle and, and we wrestle not as Paul said in Ephesians against flesh and blood, but spiritual powers and forces in the heavenly realms. We're always in battle, which means sometimes we're going to give in to sin. God knows it and that's why he said in 1 John chapter 1 through uh, verse 7 through the Apostle John, if we say that we have no sin, we what? We make God out to be a liar. He, he knows we commit sin. And he's not telling us with prayer that, hey, no sin at all for 30 days, then you can pray or, or anything like that. But there is a type of sin that does, in a major way, interfere with prayer. And it's simply what could be called unrepentant sin. Unrepentant sin. It's a type of sin where someone really doesn't care at all, and they're going to go ahead and continue in sin unabated. Probably perhaps the biggest example of this is David's sin of adultery in uh, the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, he commits adultery with Bathsheba. He tries covering it up. He sets up Bathsheba's husband to be killed. He doesn't confess it, and most Bible scholars estimate it's about a year from the time he initially committed adultery with Bathsheba till the time he was confronted by Nathan the prophet. He just went on for a long time, engaging in sin, covering it up, not confessing his sin to God, not coming clean about it, not repenting of it. Finally, he had to be confronted with it. That's the type of sin that is the problem in the Christian life, where we just simply are going to do it anyway. Maybe a sin involving conspiracy and planning where we go for days and months planning to do something. Or maybe where we're deceiving someone. Where we've lied to them and we continue to lie. But even if we've stopped, we've really not come to confess that to them. Some sin that involves time, uh, planning, and purposeful intent to stay in it. That's the type of sin that gets in the way of prayer and becomes a big problem. Look over in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. You're simply actually going forward, just one book. Look what Peter says about the importance of purity or a life that is lived for God and how that a lifestyle where someone is just going along with sin and not doing anything about it is going to be a big problem when it comes to prayer. Verse 10, 1 Peter 3. Peter writes, For whoever among you would love life and see good days, must keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Verse 10, or 11, I'm sorry. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Verse 12 now. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Here again, the idea is not someone that just commits sin of weakness or even a habitual sin, but someone is simply doing evil as a lifestyle choice. Um, an illustration he gives is in verse 10, someone whose tongue or their speech patterns involve evil or deceit. If someone's just a habitual liar, 
either to get themselves out of a jam or to impress other people. And they're always telling stories, embellishing, things like that. They've kind of chosen a lifestyle of using the tongue that's to be used for blessing and encouraging others to simply deceive others. That's an example of someone who is simply um, engaged in evil to the point where the Lord's face is against that person. The face of the Lord, verse 12, is against those who do evil. But again, verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to what? Their prayer. So if a person's living a righteous lifestyle, and righteous means not sin-free or perfect, but they're going the right trajectory. They're going the right direction. I have a lot of students uh, that if someone asks me, well, how, how's so-and-so doing? I have to say, well, uh, they're a two steps forward, one step back kind of student. For the most part, they're going the right direction, but sometimes I have to take them aside. But I say, they're going in the right trajectory. But then there's some that are in absolute rebellion. They're not coming to school at all. They don't want to do anything you tell them to do. They've chosen just to do the opposite of what they should be doing. And that's what Peter's talking about here. With those kind of individuals who are doing the opposite of what God says, God says his face is against them. And it implies he's not listening to their prayers. Oh, he hears them. Just like all kids will hear what their mom says. Right? <laughs> Christian, uh, they'll hear, but they may not listen in the sense of acting upon it. So God will know you're praying, but if you're living a lifestyle that's in opposition to what he wants for you, he's not going to be acting upon those prayers. Now, most of the time, this problem takes care of itself because a person that's choosing an active, sinful lifestyle doesn't want to pray. They don't want the guilt. They don't want to have to think about what God thinks about. A lot of times, it's cut off right there because that person doesn't want to pray. With David and his sin, uh, there are no psalms that were written during that year period of his adultery, his cover-up, the murder of Uriah, and refusal to confess the sin. No psalms written during that time, probably because he didn't want to try to talk to God. It just made him feel more guilty. But here, James and Peter entertain the idea that some Christian thinks, well, I can just engage in sinful lifestyle and still ask God for things. Lord, protect me. Lord, give me this. Help me with this. Help so-and-so. If they're even thinking about praying, James says, don't. Peter's saying, don't, because God's not listening to those prayers. But the main point is, deal with that sin. Don't allow sin to go unaddressed or unabated in your life, because it will stop prayer. Unrepentant sin, where you're not doing anything about it on purpose, will stop prayer. And if prayer is stopping in our life, how awful is that? That God is not even listening to what you're requesting and that that's how far or how disconnected you are between yourself and God. You're in a sinful state and you don't want to die in that state and you don't want to stay in there any longer where you become even more comfortable. Deal with it quickly. If you notice you're not praying, it's because you're doing something that God doesn't want you doing and you're not really trying to change that at all. You need to work on that seriously and that's what Peter and James are both saying. Uh, the second prayer problem is selfish motives. Look at James 4, 1 through 3. James 4, just go back. We can go back and forth a little bit in this area uh, between James and Peter. This at first seems a little challenging uh, to see what is the problem that James is dealing with, but he does call it selfish motives. So we're going to try to figure out what the outworking of this is. James says in verse 1 of chapter 4, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Verse 3, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Okay, well, let's pause here. We could go on and get even more context to what seems to be the problem, but remember this is in the early stages of Christianity, and a lot of principles that have been part of our culture and our understanding for a long time were brand new to them, and here he entertains the idea that there are battles among people and they're quarreling and fighting and even maybe a murder might be committed. Murder is cited at times in the New Testament as a sin. Some people maybe thought, hey, if I get angry enough and I need to take that person out, they could. Well, here 
Obviously, that is wrong, and it's clear in Scripture it's wrong, and we know that it's wrong. But what is the underlying problem here? He talks about quarreling and fighting because of people not having what they want. It says the people here, uh, verse 2, they covet. That means you want what someone else has. They have a car, or they have a house, or they have a life that you want, but you're not able to get it for some reason, and you just turn that anger towards them. Talking bad about them, maybe stirring up uh, conflict with them, gossiping, things like that. Oh, they're always doing that. Did you see what they did? All that kind of stuff where it's just stirring up drama, we call it sometimes, and ill will about someone else. <clears throat> James says in verse 3, when you ask, you don't receive. Or when you ask for things that you might want, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you might spend it on. Uh, uh, spend what you get on your pleasures. Here, apparently, some are praying that they might get more stuff just like the Joneses. Remember, everyone tries to live up to the Joneses. That, I always heard that was growing up. I didn't know who the Joneses were, but uh, they were the standard, right, Mary Gail? They were the standard to get, to get something. Well, here, apparently, in this infant stage of Christianity, some were th seeing maybe a uh, prayer like a genie in a bottle. If you just prayed enough, God's going to give you the same stuff your neighbor has. Your neighbor has a 26-foot boat. Maybe you'll get a 26-foot boat. And you just need to pray about it. But you're really just envious and you're coveting of that other person. So James says here you're praying with the wrong motives. You're praying simply that you might spend it on your pleasures. First of all, it's okay to have nice things. James is not saying, hey, you've got to downsize to a tent and be content with that all your life. That's not the point. Uh, Paul will honor those who are wealthy but yet generous. What James is isolating here is simply that selfish mentality where you're using prayer as a tool just to get more stuff. Again, like rubbing the genie's bottle. I, I, I want three wishes and I want this, this, and this. But it's purely a selfish request because you want it maybe here to keep up with somebody else. You don't want to be looked down upon. You want to feel like you're just as good as everyone else. And that's a wrong motive to have things. You're praying that, hey, I might have a house that I might have plenty of room for my family, or I might be able to have people over, or I might be able to keep myself dry and warm. Those are all good reasons to pray for things. Or even to pray for nice things that we might uh, consider something that's uh, maybe even extravagant. It's okay, Lord, this, Lord, I'd love to have this. It would bring calm and peace to my life. But if, if someone's looking at, hey, I just want to impress others, and Lord, give me this, or I just want to use all my time out on the Caribbean, and things like that, where it's simply a selfish thing, but prayer is seen as a way to get it. James nips that in the bud. He says, you don't receive because you're asking for the wrong motives. So we just need to watch out when we pray. Pray for yourself and certainly pray that God will bless you with good things. But always see those good things as ways to improve your life or to be a blessing to other people. Uh, to bring good into their life by helping you with something. Always make sure that you always have the right motive for what you pray for. Uh, John teaches in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, that if we ask anything according to God's will, He hears us. So God's will should always be the forefront of what we're asking for. And why are we asking for something? And probably for the most part, we do pretty well with this whether we're praying for help with broken relationships, or we're praying for financial stability, or we're praying for health for somebody else, this is probably an area that we probably are mostly doing very well with. But Satan will try to worm his way in. And if you detect yourself being jealous of other people or envious of what they have and maybe the attention they get from other people, and, and, and prayer all of a sudden asks for things that just for selfish reasons, be careful of that because that will be a prayer problem. Number three is a prayer problem. Before we go on to prayer promises, doubt. Look at James chapter 1 now. Go back a page or so to James chapter 1. James kind of gets right in the face of Christians in his letter here to really challenge uh, some mentalities that maybe people have developed about faith and how to live the Christian life. But notice what he says here about doubting, and we'll talk about what doubting is in just a moment, in connection to prayer. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. <clears throat> if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. 
who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind, and those who doubt should not think they will receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded and unstable in all they do. Let's just let that sink in a little bit. A lot is said here, and I had to wrestle with this a lot this week, trying to make sure I isolate. What is the doubt that he's talking about? Where someone is double-minded and they're unstable in all that they do, and they're blown like the sea and the wind. I'm at, it sounds like the person's a mess in their doubt. Well, sometimes we do have doubt. And sometimes we're not sure how the Lord will answer a prayer. Let's talk about what I call good doubt. Sometimes there's a kind of doubt where we're just not sure how God will answer a prayer. Whether we're praying for health for ourselves or someone else, or we're praying again for financial blessing or at least stability in someone's life, we're not sure how that's going to happen. If we're praying for somewhere else, we're not sure if they're going to get a new job or uh, maybe a relative will leave them. We're just praying for God's blessing, but we're not sure how He's going to answer it. That is good doubt. There's a lot of things we pray about where we even say, not, not, your, or not my will, but your will be done. Where ultimately, we're not sure how God will work something out in His plan. We're not even sure what's best, but we know to take it to the Lord in prayer. We're, but we're just uncertain about how and when He may answer it. That is just fine. In fact, that's the way it should be. We're leaving room for God to work His way out. We don't pray, Lord, uh, may... A bonus check come in from work Tuesday at 12. Uh, God's not asking us to pray for that kind of certainty. Well, what is then the problem here? Well, whatever it is, the person's double-minded. They're unstable in all they do. They're blown and tossed by the wind. That's not a healthy faith at all. But they're still trying to pray, apparently. What it seems to me is the problem here is a person's praying, but they're just praying. Or they're praying and they're just, I should say, saying a prayer. There's a difference. There's genuine, authentic praying to God. Where someone thinks about what they're going to say to God. They reflect. They know they're talking to God as they express their words. But then, have you ever heard people talk about, well, could you say a prayer? Where someone's just kind of throwing up something to God. Because it's the right thing to do in the moment. Or someone says you need to have thoughts and prayers. And they're really not praying with faith, but they're kind of just saying a prayer. Because it seems to be the socially appropriate thing to do in the moment in a Christian circle. I think at least that's the problem. Where someone is praying, but they're not really thinking about God. They're not really believing that He's going to do anything about it. They're just saying words. They're just saying a prayer instead of praying to God. <clears throat> But again, it may be the issue where someone just feels, well, I need to pray about it, but they're not really talking to God about it. And sometimes with those who've been in the faith for a long time, we know too easily how to start a prayer, how to end a prayer, and say a prayer, but never even be thinking about talking to the God of the universe. There's times I've caught myself, even my personal prayers at home, where I'm praying about a problem, but... I can easily go into thinking about the problem even as I'm talking. Because I know how to say words to God. And that's, that's a problem here. And that may be close to what James is talking about here, where someone's just throwing up words to God, hoping something sticks, but they're not praying with faith. So James says that person's double-minded, they're unstable. They really don't know what they're doing, and they don't care about it, apparently. They kind of know to ask, but they're not doing so by faith. And I think the way to cure that problem is, at times before we go into prayer, taking a moment to reflect, to realize we're coming before the throne of God, that the one who made us is the one who's listening to us, 
He's the one that cares. He's the one that can do things. Where we simply slow down a little bit in prayer to make sure we're not just saying a prayer, but instead we're praying. Which means we're praying by faith. Don't ever be content with just saying a prayer or just going right into a prayer because you've said them all your life, but yet you're really not praying to God. You're just kind of talking to other people or just kind of doing what someone asks you to do. That seems to be more the heart here of what James is addressing. So prayer problems, unrepentant sin, selfish motives, and then doubt or unsuredness because you're not really taking seriously what you're doing. Let's switch gears now. Prayer promises. We're going to look at just the opposite as we conclude this morning. The first one we looked at last or two weeks ago, so we won't spend a lot of time there. Um, that I kept asking in the point, and uh, I remember Jimena responding each time with the word effective. Remember that, Jimena? Um, look what James says in James 5.16. Sometimes Bible verses, you just have to read them, believe them, and let them go. James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful. I think with the area of faith and prayer, what we have to know the most is that our prayers, when prayed from a righteous perspective, that is, we're not trying to live a lifestyle of sin, we're not trying to allow things to go unchecked in our life, that when God says we pray, <clears throat> And no matter how feeble those prayers or how short they may be or long they may be, that God tells us they are powerful and effective. Even if we stumbled over our words, even if we didn't quite know what we're asking for, we didn't, we didn't even know what was best for our life, just Lord help me. That God tells us that those prayers are powerful and effective. Constantly with prayer, God is telling us to pray. That's our number one problem. We don't pray when we ought to. We forget to pray. We, we talk to everybody else about what we need instead of God. So the, the bulk of material in the Bible about prayer is to pray. And basically God is saying here, just do what you need to do and I will take care of the rest. And that's what it means here when it says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I don't think we fully understand. Because Scripture doesn't really reveal exactly how God works and when. But we don't fully understand how powerful these prayers are to God. But understand that when you pray to God, you're doing something that He can't make you do. He chooses not to make you pray, so your prayers automatically are valuable. And when most people are cursing God, making fun of Him, ignoring Him, when His children will pray to Him, take moments out of their lives just to talk to Him, about what they're struggling with or what they want him to know. God tells us in response, those words are powerful and effective. Just like when a child will tell a parent, I love you. Or when a child says, sure, mommy, I'll do it. Those few words will just capture a parent's heart. And how much more so our Heavenly Father when his children are responsive. So even if you're not sure how God is answering your prayer or when He will, or even if you're asking for the right thing, He just wants you to keep praying. Just keep praying. Don't give up. Don't abandon prayer. Don't think, well, it doesn't work. It's always working when you're praying to God. He is doing the work because the true power of prayer is God. It's not you saying a certain formula of words or getting it right exactly what you're requesting. The power of prayer is always God. So he tells you, when you pray to him, your prayers are powerful and effective. That allows me to know that it's not my job to get everything right in prayer. Or I've got to just write it down every time because I don't want to mess it up. I mean, obviously we want to plan and prepare. We want to get our words right. and That's a great thing. But don't think that the power of prayer is up to you. And that if I don't say it right, God won't act on it right. Just know that when you go to him in prayer and speak to him with the most feeblest of words, your prayers are powerful and effective. Finally, and this is the hidden gem of all scripture, I think. 
Your prayers have the help of the Holy Spirit. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 26. For years, um, I never saw this. Or when I did see it in Scripture, I, I didn't know what to do with it. And I just kind of let it go because I it seems somewhat of a mystery text. Um, other verses in the same chapter seemed a lot more clear and understandable. But I want you just to think about this because we're going to close on this text. Something that the Apostle Paul tells the Roman Christians about what the Spirit of God is doing when we pray. Verse 26 and 27, Romans 8. In the same way, Paul says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Verse 27. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Let's just pause here. Do you see why when I did read it in the early years of my life, I just kind of kept reading? There's a lot of mystery here. There's more that I don't understand than I do. But as I kind of learned over time in my life, when I, when I don't understand certain passages, and they're not always as easy and clear as Acts 2.38 about baptism, just kind of stand back from it a little bit and try to see the big point that's being communicated. The big point is that God is helping us when we pray. We know in Scripture that upon baptism we receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God lives within us personally. In some places, Scripture says, as a guarantee of our salvation. But in this text, we find the Holy Spirit lives within us for one express purpose at times, and that is to help us when we pray. Verse 26 again, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Just pause here. That means when we struggle to pray, when we don't feel like praying, or when we just get a few words out, and it's very short, we feel like, oh, that was nothing. And I, I don't. What Paul is saying here is the Spirit is right there. He says we don't know what we ought to pray for. Just pause here. We're not even sure what we're asking for. This Lord help me. I don't know if I'm going to keep this job or go on to another one, or I don't. I don't know what the best thing to do with my children are, my grandchildren, or this conflict I'm having with my neighbor. I have no idea how to fix this. Things like that. Things that perplex us in prayer. And we don't know even know what to ask for. It says the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. That is the Spirit's praying alongside of us in some way. Not that we hear Him audibly. Don't try to wait for some small voice in your head. That, oh, that's the Spirit praying with you. It says here in wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people and does so in accordance with the will of God. Here, the best I understand this text to say is simply that God's Spirit is praying along with our spirit. And even as we struggle, the Spirit of God is taking what we intend to say or even what we should say up to the Father in heaven according to the will of God. And that's exactly what John said as far as what should happen. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So the, the Holy Spirit's there assisting us in our prayers. Kind of like as I said at the very beginning of the lesson. It's tax season. We all want to know our taxes are done properly. We don't want a letter from the IRS. So we'll use some kind of tax assistance to make sure we get things right. If I understand this right, what God is saying He does is even though we wrestle with prayer, His Spirit is right there to make sure things are right. And we'll speak or intercede to God on our behalf because He knows what we're really asking for. And the Spirit of God knows really what we need. And as you think about that, if you think about that, that's a wonderful promise. Where even when your prayers don't feel right, the Spirit still prayed with you. Or even when you just don't want to pray, just a few sentences come out and you're done, the Spirit still prayed with you and took what you meant to say or what you needed to say to the Father. 
this is how much God loves us. That he, he wants to make sure even in our prayers we feel safe and secure and that we are. And He has a Spirit living within us to help us in our prayers. What a blessed assurance. So we don't feel this pressure of always getting our prayers right or we don't fall back on uh, some kind of formulaic prayer that a church hands down where you just say words to make sure you get it right. That's going the opposite direction. Here you find out you don't have to get it all right in your prayer. It's not up to you. What Scripture says is take yourself to prayer. Pray what you can. Pray what you know you need. And know that the Spirit of God is there praying with you to take fully to God all that you maybe needed to express but just didn't for whatever reason. That's a great assurance. And that's how great our God is. Take on the prayer problems. And Satan wants to worm his way into every prayer and ruin it. Take on those problems. But then know there are great prayer promises. That your prayers are powerful, they're effective. And even if you're not sure about that, the Spirit of God will be there praying with you. By faith, we know that. So that those prayers arrive with God and what we truly need and need to express is clear to him. You can't go wrong if you just decide to pray in the right place. As we conclude this morning, and maybe take on this challenge of prayer. Remember, Satan doesn't want you praying. He's going to try to mess it up all the time. But your Heavenly Father dearly wants your words expressed to him. Don't allow time to go where you just don't pray. Don't give up on prayer. Don't think it doesn't matter. Don't resort to just saying prayers and things like that. Don't do thoughts and prayers. Pray. And your life will be greatly blessed because of it.